Uh, I mean, yeah. Thank you all. Welcome back to Leaders in Public Health. For those who are joining us for the first time, this is a series that we started this year um, to bring in some of the greatest leaders in public health across the globe. Uh, it's an effort to expose our students, faculty, and staff to people that are innovative thinkers, leaders, and doers um, locally, nationally, and globally. Um, and hoping to share through this Leaders in Public Health series some real world evidence and tips on how to create the change in the world that many of us are here believing in, whether around communication, around inclusion and belonging, around innovation and entrepreneurship, or most of all around using data to drive change. With that, I'm just tremendously honored to welcome Alex Azar, the 24th Secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services for our, this month's Leaders in Public Health series. Secretary Azar's commitment to public health and service steered our country through a tremendously vulnerable chapter in our nation's history, the COVID-19 pandemic, while also affecting measurable and historic change for some of our nation's most pressing health problems. During his tenure as secretary, he was charged with leading 85,000 employees and a budget of, of over $1.4 trillion, the largest budget of any cabinet department in the world, to protect the health of all Americans by providing essential human services. As we'll talk about over the next hour, many of you are eminently familiar with one of his flagship initiatives that he did not anticipate when he stepped into the job, um, Operation Warp Speed, which we can all thank for the vaccines that make it possible for us to be here today. He also led numerous other initiatives, um, some of which we'll talk about, um, including banning flavored e-cigarettes, creating and implementing program to end the HIV epidemic in America, and the first rural health initiative to improve access and quality of care, which I know that many of you um, within the school care deeply about. In addition to tackling domestic public health issues, Secretary Azar has played significant roles on the global health stage, including leading our global health security efforts, representing the US in the World Health Assembly, and working with the WHO on numerous initiatives, including around the Ebola epidemic. Between his various tours in government service, and we'll talk a little bit about the course of career, he's been in and out of government. He also has had an impressive career in the private sector, uh, in particular through positions at Lilly USA, the largest affiliate of global pharmaceutical leader, Eli Lilly and company, including as president from 2012 to 2017. Before his tenure at Lilly, he was Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2005 to 2007. Before that, he served as HHS General Counsel, and he is one of our few leaders in public health who comes here having a Yale degree. He was a YLF grad, <laughs> so we don't have, often I bemoan the fact that people somehow skip this amazing institution, um, but Alex went to Dartmouth um, as an undergraduate, graduating summa cum laude in government and economics, has his law degree from YLS, um, served as clerk for Justice Antonin Scalia on the Supreme Court, as many of our YLS grads do tend to do, um, and then, of course, has had this storied career since. So, Alex, truly a pleasure. Um, thank you for joining us, and I welcome you up to the stage. Thank you. So as usual, we're gonna do about 30-ish minutes of conversation between me and Secretary Azar, and then uh, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So think ahead um, as we're going through. So welcome back to Yale. Thank you. Really honored to host you back here. I'm gonna guess that when you were a student, you did not spend time in this building. Did not. <laughs> I lived, in, lived close. I was in the Taft apartment building all three years. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, we're welcome to YSPH. Um, we are, so um, Alex and I got to know each other through collaborations on the Aspen Health Strategy Group, which he sits on uh, by virtue of his uh, position through all of the former HHS secretaries have a role there. And actually have had lovely um, conversations and I've been, I picked his brain about Operation Warp Speed and that was part of what led to um, the invitation here. In addition, it's not often that we get the chance to have a secretary of HHS visit. So truly, truly honored. Um, I'm going to start with a question that many in our audience, I'm looking around, I'd say probably about two thirds of the folks in the audience are current students, um, many of whom are thinking about their next steps. Our faculty as well are always thinking about kind of leadership, how they create change in the world. I would love to hear a little bit from you about your journey into HHS. I talked about the big picture part during the intro, but would love to hear about how you got involved in HHS, that path from law school 
um, to HHS and, and any tips or tricks that you might have for those in the audience. So uh, first, delighted to be here. So happy to be back at Yale. Uh, I, I, I love coming up and, uh, and visiting. My wife came, came with me because uh, we love being here so much. Uh, and so thank you for having me. And I uh, just want to say how lucky Yale is to have Dean Ranny here. Um, uh, I, I've gotten to know her over the last year, and just uh, Yale is very, very fortunate to have her leadership here. So thank you for having me up. Um, I get asked about my career a lot, in part because it's so preposterous. Um, <laughs> the the sort of the ways that it went here and there, and I think it's a good lesson for any of you at a top school like this, that you, you can't really predict where you'll end up. You can have a vision of that. You can't predict where you'll end up. But um, I say I've sort of been struck by lightning many times um, in my career with the opportunities, opportunities that I've gotten, and one can't predict um, that one will be struck by lightning. This is not my public health advice, by the way. You can put yourself <laughs> up on the field where you have the opportunity to be struck by lightning. And so <laughs> that's sort of what I've always tried to do is to be in that position. So um, when I was in college, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I actually thought I was going to go be a big business person and you know run big companies and things. And it ended up when I, I, I worked at a consulting firm for a summer after junior year. And I was like, I can't do that for three years before I go to business school. I didn't, it just didn't intellectually connect with me. And I had had, uh, um, I, I'd taken a course in jurisprudence from a fellow who had been a judge, a Jewish judge in Weimar, Germany. Fascinating. And he had just, and I became his research assistant, and he got me uh, very interested in the law as an academic concept. And I figured, oh, you know, I can keep, I'm pretty good at this academic thing. I can keep it going. Got into Yale, fell in love with Yale, went there. Um, did pretty well there also. Um, and I actually found Yale to be a, an, an incredible academic environment. Um, the law school, uh, it's not about grades. Once you're in, you're sort of as Guido Calabrese, the old dean, you say you're off the treadmill. Um, cause it's just such a, it's like this intellectual feast. You're not competing. Did that quite well at that. Uh, got to clerk, as you said, for Justice Scalia. And then I figured out, it started down the normal lawyer path on the, so I got on the treadmill then, uh, you know, go work at a law firm. I was at a law, I worked for Ken Starr, who you all are too young to know who the heck Ken Starr is. <laughs> um, a few people in the audience, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> went, went to, went to his, the law firm he was at, was there. Uh, he became the Whitewater prosecutor. That was the Bill Clinton uh, investigation, Whitewater. And he said, you are now working for me on that. So, you know, you don't really, you just- You do what you're, you're told. You do what you're told. Yep. <laughs> so I was a prosecutor for a couple of years, went back to law firm life um, uh, because it was time, we were getting married and it was time to sort of get back on the treadmill pathway. Um, and then, I, you know, I'm uh, quite, uh, I think it's pretty obvious. I come from a certain side of the political aisle. Um, and I had always wanted to work in government. So I was very active in the 2000 Bush campaign um, as a lawyer. The head of my law firm was uh, the head of a group always called Lawyers For. So there's lawyers for Biden, lawyers for Obama, lawyers for Bush. So I was the guy who was the deputy sort of doing all the work. Awesome. And this was still back in the time when the Lawyers For groups were just nothing. Like there were nothing burgers. It was basically a way for people to sign up, pretend they were engaged. You know, they get briefings, they give money. Nowadays, being a lawyer with campaigns is a little bit different. Um, back then, it was just like total, you know, nothing burger. Until 7 a.m. on Wednesday in November, and I got a phone call saying, Alex, we need 200 lawyers in Florida by this afternoon. Can you make that happen? <laughs> so, wow. so I set all those down, hanging chads, did the litigation that became Bush versus Gore. I was part of the team in Tallahassee I didn't know that. That's fascinating. that did that. Um, and then I worked on getting cabinet members and the White House staff, their ethics clearance, their FBI background checks, all that done. And um, I had been told, uh, one of my political mentors had said, uh, you don't want to go be a staffer. I was, I was like 30. How old was 30 I? something. 33, 30. Yeah, 33. He was like, you need to not be a staffer. You need to be a principal officer of the United States. You need to be a general counsel of a cabinet department. So I got, I'm going to be general counsel cabinet department. <laughs> so I interviewed for a couple of them, didn't get them. And it's April. I'm thinking, okay, I'll just stay in practice, wait for another term. I got a call from Tommy Thompson's office, uh -huh. who was the secretary of HHS, former governor of Wisconsin, saying, hey, uh, he's interviewed like 25 people, hasn't liked any of them. Uh, White House sent your name over. Any interest in being general counsel of HHS? And I'm like, mm, I guess. Um, because I'm like, I don't know. They said, well, they said, you know, I don't know anything about health care. 
said, mm. yeah, that's fine. He wants a Washington lawyer. Okay. So I had to ask where you're located. I'm a Washington guy. And I said, where's HHS located? Okay. So 200 <laughs> independents. I found it. Went over. We connected. President nominating me. I get confirmed. Um, I have to tell you as a, you know, someone from the more conservative side of the aisle as a lawyer, um, we, you know, you raised your dream about separation of powers and war powers and, you know, things like that. The welfare state is not high on the list. And, you know, so Medicare, Medicaid, the, you know, social welfare programs, public health, that is not sort of in that, you know, in the, what you're sort of raised and trained on and dream and about. And then you realize. And then you get there and you're like, Oh my God, this is one seventh of the American economy. Yeah. What have we been missing? And also the impact. Um, the one thing in healthcare and public health and what HHS does, you never, well, if, if you suffer from a lack of engagement in what you do, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Mm. Uh, because you wake up every morning with the ability to impact the lives of millions of people here and abroad. And I think having an important role on, on something that, that is important is the key to engagement in life yeah. and with work. And that really got me on my journey. I mean, I, it was so I ended up accidentally at HHS, fell completely in love with the place, um, was asked by President Bush and Secretary Levitt mm -hmm. to stay and be his deputy secretary. And that's when I discovered that while the law is OK, I really like being the client, being the decider. <laughs> we were, we we're doing Hurricane Katrina. So Katrina hit huh. right as so 9-11 hits right as I become general counsel. Katrina hits right as I get confirmed as deputy secretary. Um, bad yeah, things and then you I get bring, COVID. We I, need to. I, you know, I'm, keep like a, I'm like I'm like I'm like I'm like flypaper for bad public health events. Um, so Katrina hits, and I'm sitting there chairing a meeting of all of the divisions of HHS, and and somebody says we need to do this, and the lawyers the lawyers say, oh, we can't do that. I said, I just do what's right, get it done. And one of one of my clients who had been really <laughs> um, very lawless whenever I was general counsel, yeah. said, welcome to the dark side of the force. <laughs> <laughs> like decide I like making decisions. <laughs> well, and, and it's extraordinary. The, the good that you did in those various roles for the health of the country exactly. is actually tremendous. And and I would I would love to kind of share some of that. Um, and I will say out loud that one of the ways that Alex and I kind of first bonded, we sat next to each other on a plane on the way to Aspen <laughs> as we were going to talk about, and, and we'll get into this, we were going to talk about gun violence and we had this kind of discussion and he's like, you're going to disagree with me. And I'm like, I may not disagree with you as much as you think. And I said, but you're going to disagree with me. And you said, not as much as you think. And we found that, which is, I think, actually one of the really amazing things is that health does is not, yes, there's a partisan aspect, but it does not have to be partisan. And I think that where you and I are completely aligned, regardless of which party we may affiliate with, is this belief in the power of private sector, government, and philanthropy to advance the health of our society as the foundation of our economic and societal success. That without health, you can't have the rest of it. And you did that for Katrina, right? Like you stood up for people for, for supporting their health in order to allow them to then have kind of economic um, recovery from that devastation. And, and I think in your tenure as HHS secretary, you did some pretty extraordinary things. So I would love for the folks here to hear a bit about You've done a lot of things that anybody would be proud of, but you know, looking back at that time as HHS secretary, what would you say are, you know, your top uh, things that that you feel proud of? So, um, the we could talk about healthcare services and health system redesign, all of that, and I I, I really went in. I never expected to be health secretary. Um, uh, you know, I'm a recovering lawyer. Um, usually, and I had been president of a pharmaceutical company. I was not a governor, not a senator, not a university president. That would be your traditional pool of drawing an HHS secretary. So this was never on my mind that this would happen. It came at me totally out of the blue. I was minding my own business. <laughs> Got the call. Standing um, on that field with the you know, I was lightning rod. Well, I, yeah. I was literally in a field at a horse show. My daughter was at a uh, horse show and was where I got the call. Um, so uh, I would talk about that, but I, I approach things as I'm not, I'm going to call balls and strikes. I'm not, I'm not worrying about what's next, what the next job is. And so I was willing to do things that were pretty like break the eggs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then on sort of in the world of broader healthcare, I'd say the three things I'm most proud of, one would be, you mentioned Operation Warp Speed. Um, the second would be the, um, something you probably haven't heard about, which is ending the Ebola outbreak that we had in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2019 and 2020, which was the pandemic, I thought, 
we were going to yeah. face. Um, and the third was, you also alluded to it, which is banning flavored e-cigarettes, which, you know, sort of weird one to say, but yeah. <laughs> Wait, and so would you, I'm going to start with warp speed and then hopefully yeah. I'll keep an eye on the time. Hopefully we'll have time to get to the other two too. Yeah. Yeah. And I do want to talk a little bit um, about the firearms if, if mm. we have a minute. Um, but the Operation Warp Speed. So in kind of discussions that Alex and I have had previously, I actually think, I, and I will, I've said this to you, I'll say it publicly, that we would not have, A, had vaccines as quickly as we did without Operation Warp Speed, and B, Operation Warp Speed would not have gone as successfully as it had, had Alex not been Secretary of HHS, given your time at Eli Lilly, right? That pharmaceutical experience was key towards to your ability to mobilize the private sector. Do you mind sharing with folks here kind of what your takeaways were, things that you think that you were able to contribute, things that you wish we could have done differently in, in retrospect? Sure. I, I think, um, and thank you for the very kind words. Um, there's a whole team, though, and maybe part, sure, yeah. my, sort of my, perhaps my greatest contribution was assembling the right team, as with any leader. Um, totally fair. The, uh, uh, the key insight was the, the market forces work, but they work according to their own incentive structures. And I, my entire career, including now what I teach or anything else, is about the, the intersection of public policy and microeconomics and business incentives, sort of how they connect. And what I tell people always is, no matter what you think about healthcare, equity, healthcare is a right, healthcare is a constitutional right, whatever else, if you do not respect the fact that healthcare goods are economic goods and they will obey economic laws, mm -hmm. you will be sadly mistaken. And so that's really my whole career is trying to teach and implement that philosophy. So warp speed, if we relied on the normal timelines of drug companies, it'd be 10 to 12 years to get vaccines or therapeutics. And then having run a drug company, I'm able to dissect and know why is that the case? Yeah. Why, why do clinical trials take so long? Why do, why does man, scaling up, especially biologic and protein manufacturing take so long? Why does FDA approval take so long? Um, how do you do distribution? All of that. And so what I, I had, I just said to the team, we had just spent $2 trillion on COVID relief in March. And I just, I said to the top leadership of our team, uh, listen, take money off the table because money is, the economic incentive reason why things go so slowly, take money off the table. And I just, I don't know why I use this phrase. I said, be guided only by the laws of science and physics. Mm -hmm. So basically operate in a, in a fiscally unconstrained environment. I have, or I will get you any amount of money that can conceivably be spent. So like, you don't think money, like never come to me and say, we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. That's not part of this. Um, and so we came up with a plan to essentially what we call de-risk the entire enterprise. So the reason drugs are so slow to make and get get invented and get produced is that the pharmaceutical industry is the riskiest business on earth run by the most risk averse people on earth <laughs> more and, so than academic scientists yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, kidding guys and I'm what, one too <laughs> but what but what what you do when you're running a drug company is you de-risk the development of the molecule you have a molecule but then you you basically invest a little bit to learn information, and that information increases your probability of technical success. That causes you to invest more money, and you keep incrementally learning more to increase your PTS as you go. Mm -hmm. So you pace it out, slow, slow, slow. You don't commit money. You do no infrastructure investment, nothing to get to there. Um, the other thing you do is you diversify your bets. You put many mechanisms of action, many molecules within each. So you like a like a, a roulette wheel table, you put many bets down on the table. You don't just do one. Um, the other thing you do is manufacturing. This was probably the biggest insight that I brought to the table compared to anyone else would do, is when you're, proteins are are really finicky things. Um, they ha they're very, as, as Monsef Slawi, who ran Operation Warp Speed for us said, um, uh, proteins are very moody. Um, so to go from a 200 liter bioreactor production for clinical trials of vaccine to a 2,000 scale, you know, 20, 2,000 liter bioreactors to make 100 million doses is not a math problem. You don't just simply like multiply by whatever that would be, 100 or 10, whatever, um, to get there. Um, you, they, they're moody. You have to figure out what they'll grow on. How will you get the yield you need? How do you filter them? Um, how, what adjuvants do you need? How will they react in the body? Um, how do you purify everything like that? And so what we did is, if you take money off the table, we pre-funded all clinical trials up front. 
So when we were in phase one, we already had our phase three clinical trial sites ready. Mm -hmm. We were doing clinical trial enrollment. We were able to move from phase one to phase two to phase three literally within hours and scale incredibly quickly. The other thing we did is we were in commercial scale manufacturing of vaccines in June of 2020. Mm -hmm. So I was making six different vaccines in tens of millions of doses at risk, and we just would have to throw them out if, if they didn't hit. Never would be done at a pharmaceutical company, but we, were, we funded that. We guaranteed the purchase of the vaccines. So even if COVID had gone away, I signed uh, contracts for 900 million doses of vaccine with options for another 2.1 billion doses that were commitments that there's a, to basically build a market. Like, so we're the person, there's a market for this. Don't worry, it'll be bought kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing we did, and you know, people sometimes say, oh, and I, <clears throat> a little quick little story here. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the original name, thank you. So the original code name I gave for Warp Speed was Manhattan Project 2, because I literally built the entire architecture of the program on the model of the Manhattan Project, including the three people leading it. So, except our, you were saving humanity instead well, of well, that, that we'll destroying. get. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. So, so the code name was actually MP2. We called it Manhattan Project Two, and we. I was having a meeting. I, I chaired the G7 that year, the most mm -hmm. powerful countries. So we had a weekly meeting of health ministers across the G7 every Thursday morning, and I'm briefing them about this. And afterwards, my very good friend, the minister from a certain country, said, is there any chance you could not call it the Manhattan Project? That has sensitivities. Some, some <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> and so um, the team came up with Operation Warp Speed because Peter Marks, who was the head of our vaccine program at FDA, is a Trekkie, and he wanted it to be Warp Speed. I didn't like the name. I thought it conveyed we were going too fast. Which, of course, became a big issue. Yes. And, and so I, 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 we went fast because we de-risked, we pre-funded, we did all of that. In fact, the way we, one of the other ways we got to go so fast was these were the largest, some of the largest vaccine trials in human history. We had 35,000, 35, 30,000 in each arm of the clinical yeah. trial. And I, mean, I don't know how much, back, how much drug discovery you all have done, but. We've got a few here. I mean, but <laughs> okay, you want to test a therapeutic, a treatment, how do you test it? Anyone? Human. Somebody's sick, you give it to them. Do they get better? All right. Okay. And you just, and then statistics. Vaccine to prevent the disease or prevent serious consequences of disease. How do you test that? Well, I guess, you know, in theory, you could give it, to give people the vaccine and then say, here's some, you know, some COVID. Well, and that um, was a debate for well, that, right? Was, like, yes. Challenge yep. trials was a debate. Yep. And I mean, appropriately, human subjects got in yep. the way. Well, well, and never seriously considered, but it was, I mean, certainly not in our country, maybe. Elsewhere. I can't speak yeah. elsewhere. Um, but a human challenge study, the problem with that is, um, first, completely unethical if you don't have a disease-reversing treatment. Right. Um, second, the vaccine needed to be tested in the people who were the most vulnerable to serious complications in the first place. So you're elderly, you're frail, you're comorbid, et cetera. Um, so what you do is you give it to people, the, the, the heroes that are clinical trial subjects, give the vaccine to healthy people, they go out into the community and you wait to see until your pre-specified endpoint, uh, statistical endpoint of people get sick. You open the black box and you see how many of those people were vaccinated, and how many weren't, that's your clinical trial result. So by putting 35,000 people out there on each arm of the clinical trial, and also in the summer of 2020, we had a huge Third. surge. Um, and having the Defense Department as our partner, we could rebuild clinical trial sites anywhere in the country. We could shift from Omaha to Seattle in hours because awesome. of the Defense Department's logistics. Um, that, that's how we went fast. It wasn't cutting corners. It was that. And, and so it sounds like you wish that maybe um, Peter Marks is an amazing human and... The name, the name created some kind of connotations, challenges. Uh, I mean, uh, it ends up being a other, great, like, a great yeah. act of branding. I mean, it's remembered to this day, yeah. and I think will always be remembered. But I always just, I, I just, I, I worry if people ever have the impression of corners being cut because, in fact, these trials were. I mean, it was, it was some of the most tested vaccines to ever enter the market. There are two threads I want to pull on, kind of that you've talked about. One is around kind of that DoD collaboration, and then your larger work, both nationally but um, internationally, in biosecurity um, and global global security. And then the other is if if we have a, to talk a little bit about that kind of microeconomics perception, or kind of the intersection between the private sector and public health, because this is something that 
many of us in this room spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we create a sustainable model of public health, knowing that there are government entitlements, which are a huge, as you said, a huge sector of our economy, a huge part of government spending, a huge part of how we keep people healthy. And we're not likely to see a lot more government spending in the near future on health. And so how do we create um, a business case for health spending? And so I, I'm going to do the first one, the, the one around kind of global health and biosecurity okay. first, but then just to kind of prep, because this was not at all on something that we talked about, but as you were mentioning, I, I would love to hear your thoughts kind of for us as public health practitioners, how we can kind of help to create that business case for keeping people healthy. So, but can you talk a little about your work on on biosecurity and, and global health security? And I think Ebola played into that. Yeah. So um, I had, uh, as I said, right after I got started at HHS in the Bush administration was 9-11, anthrax attacks. And then we had to get ready for war in Afghanistan and Iraq. So we needed to get, we were quite worried about smallpox attack. And so we had to get people, our, our troops, our healthcare workers vaccinated against smallpox. Um, and so I got very active very early on in developing bio basically our countermeasures and creating the financial incentives for countermeasures and working closely with our peer countries around the world to coordinate. Um, so Mike Levitt developed the first pandemic flu plans and I was sort of his guide do, helping, really helping with that and coordinating across the G20, the G7, the World Health Organization to basically get the playbooks in place. How will we operate? And, but I guess, if, you know, as they say, what was, I don't know if it was Eisenhower, one of these famous generals once said, you know, the, uh, the playbook is, is great until the first shot is fired. You know, it's good to have a strategy, but then. Um, it was like the, the Global Health Security Index for pandemic preparedness, which was outstanding. And then lo and behold, it actually didn't, court, th th there were, right, yeah. but, problems. But, but so, I, so I was very deeply involved throughout my whole career there, collaborating globally. I think also, um, I think health, security, health, global health investment, public health investment can be an incredible tool of health, di of diplomacy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so many countries, whether you're in Central South America, you're Africa, wherever else, um, you know, the big powers often come to you to support your defense, support your security services, to build an airport, often have you pay to build the airport, give you debt, charge you serious interest, and then, you know, like repossess your country. That's how a lot of these big countries operate. Um, building hospitals, clean water, clean sewer, um, access to medicines, uh, I, that's a pretty good way to win hearts and minds of people. And so I, I actually think that more of that is a very valuable tool. If we want to spread notions of democracy, pluralism, freedom, um, I think being the nation that also is the one that's um, making sure you have clean water and sewer sewage um, is a pretty good way to at least build some initial equity. You, know, you mentioned this was you mentioned smallpox vaccines, and we've had a couple of discussions around kind of growing vaccine hesitancy. And you've been a huge advocate for vaccines. Um, I know that kind of COVID vaccine uptake in the military has been challenging. H how would you kind of to this group of folks? How would you have us combat? growing vaccine hesitancy. Other than yeah. being clear that we're not cutting corners in the development of vaccines, that's obvious. What else from your perspective? It's hard because so much of the, we we knew going in that we were gonna have traditional pockets of vaccine hesitancy in the United States. We we, we always do. We had a um, we had a plan for dealing with that, um, certain communities certain and certain geographic areas that mm -hmm. you just know and you have a plan to deal with that. And I think on those traditional ones, I think the Biden administration, you know, took took when we had the transition, took that on, did a great job with that. Um, and maybe you know, uh, there so much as trusted speakers, trusted advocates, members from one's community who are willing to vouch for and yeah. model it was very important. Um, I did not. No one saw <clears throat> the other side of vaccine hesitancy that we've now seen. Um, I, you know, you could have knocked me over with a feather if you had told me that that would that that would be the thing you'd be that we would be dealing with. Um, the the I, I wish I had an easy solution for it. I think the I think one of the important things is um, first treating everyone as an adult um, that providing good data, um, data, education, bringing people along, yeah. um, having trusted sources of authority, um, having people out there speaking to communities that they actually will trust what they have to say. Um, 
you know, you can you can bring public health leaders up, but if somebody's distrustful of public health leaders, that's not terribly helpful. But if you can get somebody who that person in their community finds persuasive to be an advocate, that that can that can make a difference. Um, <clears throat> I do think that I think it's been a good wake up call. We, you know, as we talk about the future of public health and your mission. Yeah. I think one of the real gaps in public health is around communications and behavioral psychology, understanding why do people do what they do? How do you help influence behavior, behavioral economic studies? You know, why do we sometimes do things that are irrational? Yep. And how are there ways to actually think about fixing those incentive structures? Um, and how do you communicate effectively to that? Um, there is There are a lot of people, I mean, frankly, I'm probably one of them, that if you tell me to do something, I'm going to refuse to do it just to just to prove to you that <laughs> you can't tell me what to do. You sound like my 12 year old son. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my wife would tell you I probably am. Um, but uh, uh, but so I, and I think I think it's and I think that's probably something that we in the public health world have missed is just the different cultural dynamics within our country and how people react to, to information requests, mandates, whatever else, and really thinking through for the future, you know, how do you be effective? And if you really want a result, how can you be effective at getting that instead of just beating your head against so that you just said the same old thing? Right. You know, it's it's a super interesting mm -hmm. debate. And I know it's one that I've had kind of with some of you in the room um, around kind of this balance between mandates and uh, nudges. Yeah, nudge, right. 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 Um, the, the whole behavioral economics mm -hmm. um, idea. And and here it actually it does relate to kind of some of our discussions around around firearms and, and gun violence and kind of the ways in which we help to decrease uh, the number of gun injuries and deaths in this country. Um, the that kind of idea of the trusted messenger and how do we kind of move people from extremes into where actually the vast majority of Americans are in are in agreement, which is nobody wants themselves or a family member to get hurt by a gun. Right. And that's why many gun owners own guns. And that's why many non-gun owners don't own guns. Mm -hmm. It's both of them kind of from that belief system. But one of the spaces that I think you and I have have spent a lot of time together is thinking about how do we actually create those coalitions? Mm -hmm. Because we're never going to succeed in reducing gun violence if we don't have coalitions of people who own guns and people who don't own guns. And and would love... So just for, we sat on this um, Aspen Health Strategy Group last June, which published a report thinking about how we approach um, the firearm injury epidemic in this country. Um, how do we actually change the conversation to allow movement, not just within academia, not just within kind of one color state versus another color state, but rather on, on a national level. Mm -hmm. And and I remember kind of you coming in and, and saying to me like, you were gonna sit there with your skeptical hat on. <laughs> and, and again, we got to this space that I think where you and I are actually in tremendous alignment. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 in fact, on the plane, I told I, I think I may have even said to the dean, um, I'm not sure why I'm coming. I'm probably just going to be silent the whole time because I'm going to be like an N of one off on the side. <clears throat> um, you know, a bunch of public health people getting together to talk about guns. You know, I mean, it, it was to me fairly predictable where this was going to go. You know, take you, away the you thought I died that right. Uh, and that I, you know, had to concede afterwards. It was a very productive, useful discussion. Um, and what I think made it productive was um, the dean, I think, was really probably the intellectual leader on this, but we had a group of, um, of, of academics who had written papers to prepare us for this and thinking about it. <clears throat> and the proposition of all of them, I think, was let us start with the understanding that Americans will have guns. They'll have handguns and they'll have shotguns, they'll have rifles. We are a gun-owning culture. We have it. Um, and it's incredible if you start saying that and that proposition, how blood pressure goes can go down by just um, because I mean so much so much of everything communication everything that we do in public life or private life is about intentionality and what do you how do you view the intent of the other side the other person and can you build trust on that intentionality and just saying those words I was sort of like well, what wait wait you're you're from Yale well wait wait. <laughs> um, and um, and at that point, you can start having constructive discussions about no gun owner, no gun owner wants anyone to ever be hurt by a gun. No one, especially you don't want yourself, a family member, and anyone else to ever be hurt by a gun. So, I mean, the gun owners I know are insanely careful with gun safety. I mean, you know, when the minute I get back from hunting, I, I mean, I literally 
walk in the door. I open my gigantic gun safe and it goes in there. It, the, I, I literally don't take my hat, my jacket, my boots off. It's boom. And only I, I'm the only human who knows the combination. Like open it up, lock it away, boom. And that's how I, the, the responsible gun owners are. Yeah. And I think any of those people like me are willing to have discussions about, okay, how I think you call it as a risk harm, harm reduction, harm reduction. A harm reduction yeah. way of thinking of where is evidence and what are good tactics like for having a safe in your house. Um, and again, and um, or, you know, just safe storage things um, like we think about if you think about like seatbelts, like auto safety mm -hmm. what was the example you gave about like, car the, crash deaths like, yeah that we've the... decreased car crash deaths by 70 percent not by taking cars off the road but by putting seat belts in place changing the design of windshields and roads um drunk driving the jersey of, wall thing right? and the jersey so... yep the, the jersey wall <laughs> drunk driving some of which are laws but some of which are also educational campaigns we've changed the way that drunk driving is portrayed in the media um yeah yeah and, and, the, and there that gets back to the vaccine point which is and then you have to really think long and hard about Mandate versus educate. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, a lot of folks, are, you know, you're going to get a lot of, if you tell me I have to do it, no. But if it's, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Like, you know, if I did this and this, I, I'll feel very sh sure my family's safe and that my hobby isn't going to hurt anybody. And I can recognize the risk factors for someone in my family being, yeah. being at risk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I, we're running kind of out of time for this part of the conversation, but I'm going to do, I'm going to go to that last one, which is around the microeconomics part, which I think is so fascinating. It's actually, how do we create the case for public health? So if we're trying to create bipartisan agreement on the importance of public health, the importance of supporting the health of society, which is about health care, but that's only part of it, right? The, the access to healthcare, that's after, generally after someone's already gotten sick. There is some preventive aspect, but how, what is, if you could kind of wave a magic wand, how would you create that case for the importance of supporting health, either on the private sector side or on the government side? Um, I'd say central to it all is data, data, data. Um, generate data, generate evidence. Um, a lot of things that we think about in the world of public health by way of interventions, et cetera, are not actually founded in modern and current data. Mm. Um, it's instinct, some of it's instinct. Um, generate the data. You will convince people by making the business case by generating the data. Um, generate the data about three feet versus six feet. Generate the data about KN95, N95 versus surgical mask versus cloth versus nothing. Generate the data. Yeah. Um, start from that and convince from there. And so all the business cases, use cases come from that. And that's where I think our data infrastructure really needs improvement. I think Mandy Cohen, um, Rochelle before and Mandy now, are on the right path, which is we have to get rid of the notion that we have proprietary data sets and data feeds that are really for public health use only or for even institutions like CDC alone. Yeah. Um, and rather think of the what, what are the different roles of institutions? So like CDC, for instance, federal government may be a like me with Operation Warp Speed, a funder of data pools that wouldn't organically come up because there's not a use case economically or, or locally for them to be generated. So you fund them, but then you should serve as a data aggregator, yeah. um, making that data available, not proprietary. So don't save it for your peer-reviewed publications. Have it be there as actionable evidence for any researcher and any public health operatives to, to have that um, so that you all can be doing the studies, doing the work to convince the, uh, those of us who are not you know, medical, medically trained, yeah. oh, that makes sense, or oh, that should happen. The other point would be, you mentioned private industry. Um, Operation Warp Speed, I call it the most successful um, public-private partnership since the Apollo Project. Mm. Um, people forget the Manhattan Project, the Apollo Project. Manhattan Project wasn't DOD. Manhattan Project was Berkeley, Chicago, DOD, and others. Mm. Apollo Project wasn't NASA. It was General Dynamics, Raytheon, Boeing, IBM, NASA. If you want to have a public-private partnership, it's really important to remember the third word. You cannot treat your partner as an enemy. Your part, you, have to, you have to empathize. You have to understand what are their incentive structures, what makes them tick. And so if you want to be in a public-private, and, and if you're on the public side, respect the fact that the, the entities you're trying to work with have their own economic incentive structures and try to operate within or consistent with them, or if you need to, like with warp speed, impact them by solving a business problem mm -hmm. that won't organically be solved. Thank you. 
I could keep asking questions for another two hours, but I want to give all of you um, a chance to weigh in. So uh, we have our lovely um, folks with uh, microphones. If you raise your hand, um, we'll kind of go around. Ivory, I see one kind of back there, and then we'll get one in the middle. And for those on Zoom, if you want to put questions in, we'll try to get to you as well. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I just had a quick question. So the goal of generating data is to eventually shape consumer behavior, which would be the general public. Um, but what we've learned a lot in our classes, especially like biostatistics courses, is oftentimes people e hack or they generate data in a manner that confirm something that they're looking for and then um, present it in reportings um, sort of in a way that's misleading. Um, one specific example is the relationship between vaccines and autism and how that paper was um, sort of had to be redacted. So um, how would you suggest communication um, when we know that this is a practice that happens behind the scenes and it's done often, especially in newspapers too. I TA a class that's actually taught by Carl Zimmer, um, an, undergrad, an undergrad course in communicating um, biological information. And Carl Zimmer is a prominent writer within the New York Times where he kind of covered this. Um, so yeah, like this happens in media outlets too, where it's selective reporting of the data. So who should the burden fall upon? Um, should it be the communicator or should it be on creating a consumer that's also educated? Um, and how to interpret sort of like no, it's it's it, it, it's a really important question. I think it's also is it's probably a special challenge in the world of public health because you're not running clinical trials. Um, you know, you're 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 looking at real world evidence, oh, and you. which has all you know. That's why the drug industry doesn't get to do that. It has its incredible challenges on study design and data bias that can come with that. Um, and I, I I this this is me I. My bias is always on the side of educating the consumer of the information. Um, I don't think you get very far by not by 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 any system that prevents access, but rather just put out better data. Have have part of it is building trusted intermediaries of of data and information, mm -hmm. not silencing others, but rather establishing the brand. I mean, it's we're when we're going through a really interesting period in in human history in terms of knowledge and just news, say, you know, it used to be that you would look to say a New York Times, Washington Post um as a kind of validated trusted intermediary and filter and editor of information. Um I think in part through faults of their own, but um, but but also because of the democratization of access to information, and frankly, others able to produce, like the the costs of product of knowledge production had become so low that you've seen this like chaos of information, and mm -hmm. we've lost those trust intermediaries. Um, I think cons what I know, but I think over time, consumers like me and others. We want those trusted intermediaries because the transactions costs of filtering information and trying to sort through that is so costly in our lives, a tax on our lives, that we want the rise of new trusted intermediaries. Like, um, I think we're too early. There was a, what was the, the met, was it the messenger? There, were, there was a recent attempt at sort of an unbiased. Oh, yeah, there have been a few. Uh, yeah, like the news reported yeah. message. Yeah, didn't, didn't have a market. And it news, may, news Nation has been trying okay. to do yeah. a yeah. an online only kind of cable news network yeah. that's trying to be unbiased and it yeah. has admittedly and, 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 it may, and it may be that we're too early or we're in too much of this to for that to be credible. But I I I do I think for me trust the consumer, get the information out, show why your data is the, the best data, um, and have the Socratic debate lawyer have the Socratic debate about why the other the data isn't. Yeah. Um, and and I and my hope is that at some point we get back to where we have those in, we have institutions that we actually do trust as good filters and distillers of knowledge and information. I don't think we're there. No, we're definitely not there now. <laughs> I totally and, and I would say too, this is where we can be ambassadors, both kind of at the high school, the college level, but also that kind of all of us as we go out in the world that we can be ambassadors for for how to interpret data correctly. Um, and, and to Alex's point, right, it's the whole kind of flood the zone idea, but flood the zone with good stuff um, and explain why it's good. Uh, and we have, I think, a question in the back and then we'll move up towards the front. 
Um, thank you so much for the talk. It's been super interesting. Um, I think, especially in terms of public health, it's we're all sort of going through our classes and learning that preventative care is a really important aspect uh, that translates into clinical care and kind of takes the uh, the burden of disease off of certain aspects of healthcare. And I know you, you've talked about private and public partnerships and finding a market for things and being able to promote interest. Do you think there is uh, investment in preventative care doesn't seem to have a lot of uptake in any country across the world and um so that's kind of where there is space where you want to look at the private partnership side and try and figure out an angle that you can make it profitable for someone and there are sort of small examples of it but in terms of like a larger scale do you is it something that you feel is a responsibility to sort of take into public health and push preventative care as a long-term goal uh, so a uh, fantastic question and it plays right into my microeconomics uh uh, sweet spot in public policy and my passion for behavioral economics. So behavioral economics, I assume you all know, but it's the merger of economics and psychology. Sort of why do why do we not behave the way I was trained in terms of classical economics of supply demand curves, behavior always rational, because we're human beings. And because actually our valuations are not always consistent with classical economic ways of valuing. So for instance, the issue of prevention is so classic in that world of we we value the present so much more than we value the future. Mm -hmm. It's time value of money, for instance. So why do I um, why do I not diet? Because I really enjoy that meal and I get tremendous utility from that. And the benefit that I would get from not eating the meal for the cost of not eating is rendered 10, 20, 30 years from now. And I have a, what we've learned is I have a very high discount rate on that benefit. And so it becomes very small in comparison to the cost. So I don't do it. What, that's a human behavioral problem on prevention on sort of why do we all do these very counterproductive behavioral things. But then we have a problem with how we finance healthcare is we have a payer system that doesn't stay with us through our life. And so just think about it from uh, um, I mean, my gosh, we have these incredible cures, right? We, we, we can cure sickle cell anemia now, okay? You take a 19 year, I've seen a 19 year old kid get sickle cell anemia treatment, walks out of the hospital after 30 days without a sickle in his, in his blood. Um, but that's a million dollars, I think. Um, so I'm the insurance company. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna spend a million bucks. I'm gonna change your life. I'm gonna give you life. Um, and then six months later, you're gonna have a different insurance plan. And I don't get the benefit of that as the payer. Um, that's a really big problem in our system about sort of medical, what, like why do insurance companies not pay primary care doctors to engage in a lot of preventive, beha behavior, preventive behavior and, and patient engagement? Um, why do they not fund access to even pharmaceuticals that would have tremendous preventive benefit? I mean, you, you know, you, if, you were, if you were really thinking about prevention, my goodness, I, you know, there are certain drugs you'd say you give away for free maybe, yeah. you know, and put everyone on them. Um, but uh, um, we don't do it because of this, the, dis, the, the dis, discontinuity both in time horizon of payment and yielding benefit. And so much of the benefit is yielded by Medicare. And so the private sector would fund it. But by the time a lot of the consequences of our bad behaviors come about, we're 65 and over. <laughs> and so, you know, Aetna, United, whatever, they don't get the benefit. But it's, it's a, I wish I could tell you I had an amazing solution, but at least I can diagnose the problem and we need better economists than I am to help figure it out. But that's where I'd say as public health people who care about this learning economics, thinking about microeconomics, thinking about human behavior in that context, why we do what we do really will help you if you want to have an impact in these important public health questions. And I see many of our health policy, health economists in the audience. So I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to go up to the front. So I'm very impressed. Maybe not this year, but I wouldn't be shocked if one day you wake up and you're the president. <laughs> yeah. And not good with all with all of your experience, mm -hmm. maybe what's the most important thing you try to do to make the I'll use the word healthcare system in the United States better? Ooh, that's a great question. Very hard. Uh, it's just, you know, those sort of what would you, 
I'll just tell you my philosophy has always been put the patient at the center, build the system around the patient, um, not the rest of us. Um, but that we, you know, the dean and I probably will have different approaches. So she didn't tell you another thing. You know, you know who one of my best friends is Donna Shalala, who was, you know, the, Bill Clinton's health secretary. We share an office at University of Miami, Miami Business School, where where, where she brought me down uh, to teach, um, and. Just like with Megan or Don and I, we agree on about 80, 85 percent of the issues. The other 15 percent, we either have fun debating or we don't talk about because we, we know we're not going <laughs> to convince each other on. Um, Good and, to hear opposing sides because exactly, it makes yeah. us both be more intellectually precise. And, exactly. And on that patient centricity, I approach it again more from an economic frame. Um, I try to think. Everything I've tried to build on, health, on the healthcare delivery and financing side of the world has been, um, we have a third party payer system. Since the 1930s, we have separated the payment of healthcare from the decision to purchase healthcare. As an economic matter, you couldn't imagine you know, more dysfunction at, than that. You know, if you tell someone you can go into Walmart, but you don't have to pay for it, or you pay 15 bucks and you can take anything out you want, you take everything out. And so that does, because healthcare goods are economic goods, follow economic laws, you can't allow that to happen. So you have then entities that control and say how much you can get out. And that could be your insurance company controls through prior authorization, formularies, um, access restrictions, what you can take out, or you self-regulate by imposing cost sharing, co-payments, et cetera, that cause self-regulation of that. But how do you enable within that constraint and those distorted incentives as much of a competitive marketplace to function where prices go down and quality goes up consistently as they do in every other part of the economy? We're the only part of the economy where that doesn't happen of its own accord because of this payer dynamic that we've created. And I have always tried, how can I put on top of that incentives that make it function more like that? I'll give you an example. What is the one? Um, what is one part of healthcare where price goes down and quality goes up every single year? Give me an example. Price goes down, quality goes up every year. Just like buying new TVs at the at Best Buy. Well, I'll give you a hint. My father was a very famous ophthalmologist at Johns Hopkins. And what have I not had done? Yeah, exactly. LASIK, LASIK, quality goes up, price goes down every year. I guarantee you, I could cause quality to go, to go down and the price of LASIK to go up. Bet you a million bucks. I have one intervention that I could do to make that happen. What would it be? What? Insure it, pay for it under health insurance. And the price will start soaring and the quality will go down. Because it's a because it functions the way the rest of the economy functions as a because it's not paid for it functions as a consumer product and has all those natural incentives that work. So can we do that in healthcare? Can we build around the patient and somehow create the economic conditions that cause us as providers and payers to compete for that patient's business and cause us to compete on price and compete on quality? That to create natural buildup because you can't reg at the end and, of the day you can't yeah. reg this is where. Megan, and Don, and I will, you know, I don't think you can regulate and force that. I think you have to create we'll the economic preconditions to enable that. <laughs> but but where I do think that we both would agree is decreasing the administrative overhead and the administrative kind of bureaucratic burden for providers and for healthcare systems serves as a huge friction point that both increases cost, decreases yep, quality, sure. and makes everybody yep. less healthy. Yep. On that note, we unfortunately, as you all know, have another cl classic <laughs> comes in before you leave. Look under your seat. We have our usual swag for our Leaders in Public Health series. You may be a lucky recipient today. And as, because we are Yale, I, of course, have some swag for Secretary thank Azar you. as Great. well. Alex, thank Great. you. Thank Truly, you. thank you so much. Thank you. And make sure you go and grab some lunch. <laughs>